Hi everyone um, and welcome to Yale, uh, welcome to the Yale School of Art, welcome to uh, Yale School of Art Open Studios and in particular the Painting and Printmaking Department. Welcome to Chrome of Wars, um, a panel discussion on colour in contemporary painting. Um, my name is Ed and I graduated from the programme last year. And uh, first things, I just want to say a really big thank you to Mitch, who invited me here today to facilitate the conversation. Um, so today, um, we're going to be talking all things colour, uh, colour in contemporary painting, with three current students in uh, the School of Art in the Painting Department. Uh, we have first year, Brianna Bass, first year, Alex Puz, and second year, Mitch Miller. So for the next hour, um, it's going to be a really nice, informal, um, intimate conversation with three really exciting artists who uh, focus on colour in their practice. So without further ado, um, Brianna is going to start us off. So I'll introduce her and then, um, yeah, we'll, we'll hear from her all about her work. So. Brianna Bass is a painter from Knoxville, Tennessee. Brianna earned her BFA from the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga in 2013. She is a co-founder and co-curator of Mineral House Media, an artist-run web-based platform designed to elevate Southeastern contemporary artists. Brianna has had solo exhibitions across Tennessee at Missouri State University's Brick City Gallery in 2020, and has shown work internationally at the Tree Art Museum in Beijing, China. Her work is motivated by color's relationship to language and perception, and materialized by evolutions of system-based games. She has an upcoming exhibition this June at Nashville's Channel to Channel Gallery. So we're expecting everyone that's listening from from Nashville, please, please go and see the show. So, uh, Brianna, the, the floor is yours. All right, um, and interrupt me if um, you can't hear me. Um, so, um, hi everyone, thank you so much for coming to our panel on color. Um, I just wanted to explain my thoughts about color through the development of chromatic systems in my work. Um, starting with, um, these two paintings for the last few years, um, I've been thinking about um, color's relationship to language and painting's function as both a unified utterance and a particulate um, dissolution of les legible systems. Um, in these two paintings, um, color, the progression of color can be tracked towards the edge of the frame. Um, even as it bends away from its most obvious form, it can still be identified because of its place in the system. Um, my drive towards legibility is a response to my hearing loss, which is moderate and unpredictably impacts my ability to hear speech. Um, sometimes I can hear fully and sometimes the sentence is just sort of an abstract progression of sounds that has to be replayed and reassembled. Um, I think we're all getting familiar with this sensation as we've been wearing masks for a year and holding social interactions through this digital mediation. Um, so yeah, the, uh, the motivation of the work that I'm currently doing starts with the desire to make something legible um, that was intangible or to unify something that um, can be particulate. Um, so next slide, Ed. Um, in thinking about unified or complete utterances, I became drawn, drawn very strongly to monochromatic painting. Um, Judy Chicago's hazy uh, veils of color and Wolfgang Leib's pollen installations are about a lot of stuff and they're not technically paintings, um, but to me they're very strong in, uh, instances of particulate monochromatic experiences. Um, when I experienced Wolfgang Leib's installation in person, it was a very powerful color utterance, um, this radiant upward surge of yellow. Um, in both pieces, the color leaves the ground and enters space and connects with the body, which testifies to color's capacity to exist, not only as an object, but within and around an observer. 
Um, and in these pieces, color is a solitary thing, but it suggests ongoingness and edgelessness and surfacelessness. Next slide. Um, and this piece, yeah, so my painting is on the, the piece on the left and just a solid purple field is on the right. And I wonder about how the polychrome can, be, can behave as a monochrome through a ubiquitous and insistent pattern, suggesting void and form at the same time, like Chicago's disembodied purple smoke. I wonder about how contextualization can reduce a multitude of colors to one. Um, I'm also curious about how uh, through becoming atmosphere or background noise, pattern can behave like language becoming invisible in the process of communication. Next slide. Um, and this um, <clears throat> image of Judy Chicago's rearrangeable rainbow blocks takes an interesting extension or reversal of that monochrome question, highlighting the oscillation between a color's place in a system and its isolation um, uh, and relocatability. These particular colors um, in this installation carry within themselves very firmly settled upon identities, um, but rearranging them functions as a syntax within a system um, that one, a system that one could understand to have a pre-existing logical progression like that of the spectrum, um, which has here been disassembled. Next slide. So in my work, I use the color wheel as a starting point and there are tons of ways to approach the organization of color, but I just kind of use the basic 12, um, six or 12 divisions. Um, so yeah, circling back to the process of assembling phonetic particles and interrupted communication, um, I take that spectrum and um, complicate it and rearrange its units and try to um, and rearrange its units and um, through establishing a pattern and deviating from it, sometimes entropically or sometimes systematically, um, I search for the sensation of noise and shadow that um, relates to the interruption in communication that I was talking about earlier. So next slide. Yeah, so these noises and shadows are contingent upon the visible presence of pre-established systems. Um, the red and green at the top sort of indicate a certain truth or reality about the painting and then direct the changes which produce the outcome at the bottom, um, which ends up being a succession of opposite colors. So the red and green directs the kind of shifting of the color wheel. Um, and then the shadows um, that occur repeating in the middle are where the color wheel lines up along its like opposite, uh, along the opposite side. So um, yeah, trying to find out how to wield that shadow and find where it emerges in a sort of pseudo-scientific fashion through repeatability. Um, so sort of creating a reliable indeterminability. Um, next slide. Um, this painting from last semester continues to try and establish a system of legibility that dissolves into illegibility um, before its reassembly at the bottom. Um, most people familiar with color learn at the very beginning about primary colors, red, yellow, and blue. Um, and I'm interested in how the strength of that color system tells the observer exactly what they're looking at. So this yellow in the middle can be bent toward green or orange, and I think there would be a breaking point, um, but there's a lot of flexibility that the, um, where the context establishes that you are receiving the experience of yellow. Um, and so I'm interested in how that uh, understanding of what the color yellow is and where it exists in the context might um, interrupt the perception of um, the color that you're experiencing. Um, and yeah, so I think about in this painting a lot about disassembling the firm understanding um, that's gained through context. Um, yeah, and then one more thing about this is that the shadow is kind of like a data interruption. And on one hand, it might feel like a loss, but I think it's also a place of transformation where a thing is um, neither one thing um, or its opposite or neither itself or something else, um, which I think creates a space of longing or searching or um, listening. 
um, which can be generative as much as it is sort of um, frightening at times. But yeah, so drawing into a place of namelessness. Next slide. So I tried to isolate the uh, question of color legibility this semester by, by committing to only use um, red and green. I chose red and green because they fall into a widely agreed upon binary are, and um, are commonly understood as opposite or complementary colors. Um, though again, that's up for debate in the many ways of organizing color relationships and understanding opposites and complements. Um, next slide. Um, and I, I also decided to use these two colors because of their intense power to signify they mean so many things, both individually and together. And I wanted to play with the edges and transformations of shapes to indicate that no signification can be settled on because the compositional language of the paintings is shifting and in itself noncommittal. Um, it's become for me a confusing battle with the simultaneous contrast, um, the colors ramping each other up and um, the way that the two colors transform one another. This um, swirling painting, for example, the red on my palette was like a hot magenta until it clicked into place with the green. And now it's sort of this warm, almost like not orangey red, but, but yeah, so it's been a, <laughs> Chasing those colors um, has been a journey. Um, it's also been slightly disturbing how penetrative the colors are into like my deep spaces of thought. I've found that the space between sleeping and waking, they've saturated my visual fields. And um, in falling asleep, falling asleep happens in the exchange of red and green clouds and phosphines behind my eyes are now green and red swirls and a toss left is red and a turn right is green. Next slide. So in the first pages of the interaction of color, Joseph Albers talks about um, when the word red is evoked in a crowd of people, everyone envisions a different red. Even the Coca-Cola red manifests in color memory as a different shade for everyone, calling to attention the fact that it might be impossible to remember a precise color. I think I'm interested in an aspect of that um, maybe that there is a precise understanding of color in the mind um, that's tied to a word, which is um, unique to everyone, but I wonder how that might interfere with the experience of that color and what sort of tools are in play to suggest to a viewer what color they're looking at. Um, this painting by Albers became particularly interesting to me after studying red and green this semester. Um, he places an apparently obvious green within two gray squares. And in this painting, um, because of simultaneous contrast, the gray has the capacity to gradually take on a shade of magenta or red as your eye like moves around this gray space. Um, there's a halo of the opposite color of green that starts to occupy this space that is maybe colorless, but maybe not. Um, so the painting seems to say, um, this is green and the gray is not green. And so I wonder about how through the system of um, binary colors, what can not green be, but red. Thank you, that's all I have to say. Thank you so much, Brianna. That was great. That was great. Um, so up next we have Alex Puzz. So Alex Puzz grew up in Long Beach, California, before moving to New York City to pursue his BFA at Hunter College. After graduation, he worked as a studio assistant um, to the color field painter Robert Swain, gaining insight into the rigors of a systematic color practice. Before coming to Yale, Alex maintained a studio practice in Queens and developed his intellectual and artistic practice by attending public lectures by theorists like Michael Tarsig. He has exhibited in New York City and the surrounding region with galleries including Paradise Palace and Disturb the Neighbors. Through his painting, he explores how color visualizes mathematical change 
and the uncanny atmospheres that are generated through specific color palettes. So Alex, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Ed. Uh, thanks for moderating this conversation. It's really great to uh, be sharing this Zoom with two of my favorite contemporary artists. And um, I wanted to start this talk with this lecture, uh, excuse me, this quote by Wilfred Sellers that goes with respect to color. We have no determinate category prior to that of the physical. The latter is our point of departure. We approach the problem of constructing new forms of concept pertaining to color, not by throwing away concepts of the colors of our physical objects, but by transposing our concepts into a new key. <clears throat> it's a little bit hard to parse, but what I take him to mean is that color is always born of the physical, but it gives us a way into the conceptual because it can be unbound from material experience. So in ways paint does that, but I think it, because so much of color takes place in the eyes and the brain, it really can almost literally make new ideas appear as you mix into unnameable colors or you mix into sort of strange new color contrasts and um, spaces. Um, <clears throat> so I wanna introduce three artists that have been very instrumental in my thinking about color. Um, there are many more, but I have a bit of an intimate connection with all three of them. So. I wanted to uh, explain how they've influenced my thought and what I think their work really contributes to the field of color theory. So uh, we can go to the next slide. This is a piece by Adam Henry, who's a New York City based painter. He has an idiosyncratic approach to color in that he has adopted uh, Goethe's color system, which is the three primaries plus violet. So by using such chromatic limitation, he is able to sort of generate a kind of um, contrast within a context of similarity. So in this way, by adopting such a sort of reduced or specific color palette, he can make different spaces and different contrasts appear within a, a known set of elements. So in this case, the yellow and the red appear airbrushed, whereas the blue and violet are more solid colors. Um, and he can, he ends up separating space with very minimal variables, which shows the power of color because it, it, it always is surprising to see how he's recombining these uh, colors. Um, also, what I really like about his work is that all of the black is chromatic. So it's always mixed into black, not um, straight from a tube. He also had a show up at Candace Mady recently, which was phenomenal. I strongly recommend everybody look at uh, images of that. Um, so we can go to the next slide. This is uh, Anoka Faruqi, who is the one of the co-chairs at Yale right now. Uh, I'm sure many people are familiar with her work. And one of the main things that I take from her practice is this sort of merger of form and color. So what we see is this very sort of strange, almost digital looking painting that is completely physical um, by using this sort of modular bits of information, which are this sort of layering of concentric circles and these glitches, bruises, and material affect on the edges, we're being let into a sort of self-sorting um, color experience. She describes the moiré pattern that emerges from these stacked colors as self-sorting. So this isn't um, pre-planned, it's a process-based abstraction that ends up generating its own content, its own form through color, which is amazing to me because if color is this sort of Salarzian unbound uh, hyper object to be able to let it operate on its own terms and still generate something that is specific and nuanced uh, is just like an amazing magic trick to me. These things are, these things glow as you walk around the gallery, they change and shift. And that's a testament to the physical nature of it that just can't be reproduced uh, digitally and why color is so special and amazing as a fundamentally physical phenomenon. Um, also, I'd like to say her work is uses a somewhat limited uh, amount of colors. So similar to Adam Henry, where he uses a very set chromatic uh, limit. Hers is only so many colors put on the canvas, but it generates this almost infinity of different uh, tones and variations all through optical mixing. Um, we can go to the next slide. It's another one of uh, Anoka's pieces where uh, she says, overlays of primary colors yields a huge array of intermediary colors. And you can see that 
here that there that may be the base colors or maybe a yellow and a, a deep sort of burgundy but it ends up generating all these tones in between and making something very uncanny very strange and almost unknowable uh, while also being just so luminous um, yeah all right so we can go to the next slide uh, this is a piece by Robert Swain, uh, who I was studio assistant to and kind of where I adopted much of how I think about mixing color from. Uh, his basic system uses three coordinates, which are hue, so pigment, um, value, which is relative uh, light or dark, and saturation, so intensity, meaning the amount of gray added to um, the color. So these pieces capture so well to me a, a particular kind of sequencing of color that has a logic to it you can discern the way in which the pink moves to blue from the top left to the top right and also how the blue gets to the sort of yellow green on the bottom right and and the rest of the way around the canvas and somehow it all sort of makes sense even though the colors are very surprising on their own uh, Bob is so so much interested in the phenomenology of color, that is how colors operates on their its own terms, while also operating within the context of other colors. So in particular with, with these paintings, this one's six by six, and uh, I guess we can go to the next one, which is seven by seven. And these squares are 12 inches. So his um, he mentions that walking up to the canvas, you can sort of immerse yourself in one square and just have your whole field of vision in, in, encompassed by say the magenta in the middle. And then as you back up, the piece will kind of shimmer and shift as you start to activate all this simultaneous contrast and get into this dynamic equilibrium. It starts to feel like stained glass or you know maybe a more contemporary touchstone would be some kind of like a digital pixel generation device. Um, but it's always so much about the phenomenological experience of color, um, which, he says that his practice is seeking to get into the subject matter of color and to understand it through experience. So intuitive looking and sort of like optical decision making generate color experiences that sort of lift us from a kind of very nuanced or specific view of things. Um, so yeah, and we can go to the next slide. Um, now I'm gonna show, this is some of my work uh, and I want to explain how these three artists have influenced the way I approach color in my work. Um, one with sort of using chromatic limitation, I tend to like to stick to a sort of monochrome palette, which you can see here and behind me, but sort of sneak in sort of moments of uh, contrast. So I included this detail on the right, which has this sort of this triangle, which is this deep red to a light lavender modulation. And you can sort of discern this sequence, but behind it is this sort of light yellow green. And what it does is it competes for the foreground. So the red wants to push back and the green wants to come forward. So you get this really lovely indeterminate space that uh, is just so exciting. And I don't know that can be accomplished in any way, but color. Um, uh, we can go to the next slide. This painting uh, also is using a similar uh, approach where in the corners I've deposited this sort of like hot red or magenta kind of pinks and dark uh, burgundies to sort of amplify the light blue to unsaturated green modulation that constitutes the sort of clamshell. Uh, this piece was commented upon by Claire Ashley and during a studio visit, who's kind of the spiritual mother of this talk, she first made the connection between me, Misha, and Brianna's work. And so that's kind of why we're here to sort of figure out how, what we all have in common about the way we're thinking about painting. Um, she said that it breathes. And I think it's so true that you get this really palpable sense of like outward motion, but it also wants to come back in because there's this leaf form in the middle that is this unsaturated kind of light blue. Um, and it's just really exciting to me that through pigment, you can create a very physical experience, a very physical bodily experience. Um, and yeah, it's uh, all through these sort of step-by-step -step iterative sequences. Um, okay, and so I have two more details uh, on the next slide is one and show highlighting again, how trying to make a logical color sequence from light red to light pink 
laid over this noisier sequence of uh, unsaturated gray greens and blue to sort of draw into focus the um, pink to red, which to me is a little bit uh, in the spirit of Anoka trying to find the way form uh, and color meet to find color content on its own terms. In this case, trying to push the contrast or push the legibility of color sequences to um, draw things into focus. And there's one more uh, on the next slide which is again using sort of red and yellow up over this sort of swampy greens to create a very palpable sense of space even though everything is super flat uh, because of the flash paint that I use. Um, so all of this is to say I think that the the most amazing thing about color is that it is almost like a qualia to use a philosophical term in its own right which means that it exists autonomously, but also maps itself to other things. I guess you could say it's deterritorialized, but that leads me to think that uh, exploration of color is um, on the next slide, kind of like uh, a Marc Jacobs bag where it's, it's kind of always about color by color painters for color by color theory in collaboration with color theory for color by color painters. And uh, yeah, so thank you so much for uh, coming to this talk today. And thanks Ed. <laughs> Thank you so much, Alex. And last, but by no means least, we have Mitch Miller. Mitch uses they, them pronouns. Mitch Miller is a Los Angeles-based painter and printmaker and installation artist. Mitch earns their BFA from the School of Art Institute of Chicago in 2015 and is a current MFA uh, cancer in painting and printmaking at Yale University. Mitch's abstractions place an emphasis on color, pattern, vibration, layered symbols, and the seductive object. Their paintings explore the trans and non-binary experience through pattern, color, vibration, scientific, and environmental metaphors. Mitch's practice is informed by an investment in queer histories, with theory and color theory. So Mitch, the ground is yours. Hey, how's it going? Thank you for introducing me, Ed, and for being here. Um, and thanks to Alex for inviting me to do this with all of you wonderful artists. Um, I hope that you guys will jump in and make this kind of a more conversational portion um, because I would love to kind of switch it up a little bit. Um, and maybe just have it be a little more fragmented, which is almost, which is kind of parallel to my understanding of color. Um, so something I think is really interesting about color is, is that with memory, one of the most faulty aspects of our memory is color memory. Like if you try to recall someone, the color of someone's sweater, it's like the first thing you're gonna get wrong. But at the same time, if you experience a color in real time, the nostalgia of that can bring you right back to a specific memory. So it's kind of this weird, um, you know, opposite effect that it can have. Um, and these are prints, or you can go back a slide, but these are prints by Son and Zimmer, who's a Chicago printmaking duo of Nick and Nadine. Um, but I was a printmaker before I was any other type of artist. And through printmaking, color exists a lot more like light than like paint because it's such thin films of actual ink being laid down. So there's a lot of opportunity for overlay and intermediary colors, which is something that Anoka is exploring as well. And so kind of through just doing the process of printmaking all the time, I was just fully seduced by the kind of almost like opening a present experience of pulling up a silk screen or printing a layer from a woodcut and seeing the co color overlay that's possible. And I've kind of tried to recreate that through my work by like any means. Um, and you can go to the next slide. This is a, a work by Brie B Brooks, who's in our program. Um, and I pulled this up because I feel like they use a really great mix of like intuitive color associative color, cultural color, nostalgic color, and color through like humor, like it's emphasizing humor through color as well. There's so many, the color is really performing here in so many roles. 
And that's something I think about with Brianna's work a lot is that like, especially with the Red and Green series, you're kind of calling up Red and Green as the actors like perform in your work. Um, and I don't know the way I think about color um, and how it really like performs. And that is such an experiential part of painting and painting now, I think a lot of us are, especially the three of us are thinking about the experience of looking and especially from like a stagnant material, you know, that was once fluid, but now has been frozen in time. Um, and the color keeps it moving um, philosophically, emotionally, all these different things. And I, I find that Brie does that really successfully in their work. Um, this is Jake Voggs from Chicago. They're part of a collective, um, a queer radical visibility collective, um, which is also a part of Rebirth Garments. But I'm really inspired by fashion and kind of like reclamation of fashion by the queer community. And uh, another thing I like about color um, and about, or I guess like an interesting kind of segue into it is that octopuses put on the most vibrant camouflage when they are in danger. Um, and I think that's kind of like subverted by fashion in interesting ways or like an, a relevant thing. And I just also love, um, Ed read my artist statement or bio, which I realize is a bit redundant now that I hear it back to me. But he mentioned that I'm thinking about like environmental metaphors or scientific metaphors through abstraction. And one of those is thinking about um, the octopus as like a queer symbol. And so um, that's often kind of like a lens I'll put on myself to think about, um, to think about color. And yeah, this is a uh, sky who is the founder of uh, Rebirth Garments and, and created everything they're wearing. So like soft sculpture and fashion and nylon and plastic and all these sort of things influenced me color was. And also just excite me outside of even being relevant to the paintings. And I think that color is, can be really exciting period. Um, yeah. <laughs> And uh, so this is a painting by Phil Hansen, who's one of the Chicago Imagist painters and uh, still a living legend and teaching occasionally at the Art Institute and um, one of my early painting teachers as well. Um, and they were just one of my first kind of, you know, pa paths into being seduced by an artist's use of color um, and then wanting to I maybe have that experience myself. Um, I was like really like 20 years old when I had them as, as a teacher. So it was really uh, impactful in the moment. This is a, another painting by Phil Hansen. So he, he often kind of infuses text into the work and they all often are really philosophically heavy. Um, and that's something, I mean, color has the ability to, to emotionally tune a painting so much. It's like having a dial on the side of the canvas and you can kind of play with it. And especially when using literal language like in this piece, but also when using more of an abstract language, what you're communicating will be tuned. And so that's just a really powerful part of color use in, in work. Uh, this is an artist, Felipe Pantone, and they work in print and painting on massive scales and on really small print scales. And I think that their scale shifting, but use of like very processed like digital colors, um, it's just something like mesmerizing and exciting about that to me. And it's something I do a lot in my own work, kind of like shift materials based on the scale. Um, so this is like kind of a hybrid digitally printed vinyl paint, like essentially installation to create a mural this size. And uh, this is a this is a the first work of mine in this in the slideshow, um, and it's like a modular piece, and the color is really inspired by like candy hearts with the little um, kind of text phrases on them. And Brianna spoke a little about legibility in their work. And I think about like 
legibility communicating and kind of like communication breakdown, um, especially like in like a, a queer, through a queer lens. Um, I often think about queer people like trying to communicate with each other secretly or like across vast distances throughout time. Um, and that's just something that I think about a lot and kind of uh, process through the work. But the, uh, yeah, here you go. Yeah, yeah. So um, I love how you called it modular um, because, you know, looking at this piece, um, you can read it in so many different ways and kind of make your own almost uh, haiku out, out of the work. Um, and it can be rearranged uh, linguistically or it can be rearranged um, to create different symmetries or asymmetries with uh, the color of the panels. Um, so do you kind of like the idea of uh, that kind of uh, multi-format uh, potential just to be in the in the kind of mind of the viewer or um, is this a piece that you know every time it's installed it could be rearranged um, and a kind of new poem could be formed either chromatically or linguistically? I would say the, the latter that it could be rearranged um, but I, I think that your eye and I think this is informed by the, the color experience it bounces around mm -hmm. almost no matter how you approach it. Um, so I, maybe the experience jump, the actual experience is the jumbling, um, or at least that's the goal. <laughs> but I, yeah, but, but I would be, um, I would be thinking about installing it in different ways for sure. And this is a side profile and you can kind of see the, the drip on the sides. And um, often I'll have what is like experienced as a fairly flat surface with, but the sides will be allowed to drip um, kind of as a like nod to like the original fluidity of the paint, um, which for me is like a direct metaphor to like a fluidity of existence um, of my own maybe in a lot of different ways. Closely, and, and like the fluidity of the language that is used as well, and you know, these words depending on the context that they're in. That's great. And uh, this is an installation I did for the Facebook artist um, in residency program, but it's, I, I used it as an image because I think that color is like, especially for me, it's like this kind of like play, it's like research, but it's like playful research. It's like pseudo fun research, you know? And I think we all have different ways of like breaking it. I mean, we're all taking it on like different levels of seriously, but ultimately it's like the most playful part of my practice. And I want it to bring a playfulness to the work and like to the experience um, of the work. And I just, this installation is one of, one of my more uh, playful feeling things. And yeah, I mean, maybe pastels have like an association to like childhood or like something more playful for me. Um, and so I, I'm also often drawn to them and I often use the color uh, pink. And I, I did kind of a similar stint in my first year where I was really dedicated to pinks only. And that's because I was really, uh, really kind of like against pink for a really long time, like on a personal level. And I think a nice side note to that is that like the first time color is gendered in your life is when you're assigned a baby blanket, pink or blue. And that's kind of always resonated with me as this like really weird intersective moment of like color and like associative color and kind of like cultural color being put upon me in a moment that also like a gender assigned at birth was. Um, so I, now I've kind of like reclaimed pink um, and really love it. So I don't know, it's an interesting relationship that's been developing throughout my life <laughs> with that color. Um, this is a acrylic painting on panel, but I think it really highlights like an intermediate or, intermediary color. Um, I'm using a kind of a stencil making process that's really akin to printmaking where I'm laser cutting um, into vinyl to create stencils and then uh, airbrushing like thin layers of pigment over top of each other. So no matter what, there's like a, a translucency to each layer. So you're going to see like a, a multitude of colors through each one. Um, so yeah, you can go to the next slide. 
but all all of these have like the same logic um in which there is like a transparency to each layer um and creating a vibration but all of these works are um kind of influenced by like um this like underwater kind of like octopus metaphor um that is deep in my research um as a painter and uh this piece uh is like the start of a new ser series um in which like i'm kind of using the disco ball as a way of looking in at light and at color and i think that's something that i found interesting um about brianna's uh talk just because I, I didn't hear you say light or shadow, but it's really prevalent in the work. And um, it's something that I'm thinking about in, in um, the previous works when I was thinking about kind of underwater and thinking about how light and color like refract through. Um, and in this work, it's much more about reflection. And so there's just so many different ways to kind of like start looking in on color it, there's really like an infinite scope of, of where you can put your lens. Cool, that, that is us, I think. Brilliant. We can hang out on this slide. Sorry? We can hang out on this slide while we talk if you want. Yeah, yeah, I've, I've got a whole, whole group of uh, your slides kind of um, dotted about. So I'll flick through them as we uh, cover some of these topics. Now I realize we don't have that much time left. So maybe we make it into a bit of a kind of quick fire situation and uh, I'll bring up a topic. And if any of you feel like you want to uh, speak to it, then uh, feel free to, to jump right in. Um, and throughout your presentations, I loved all of them. Um, even more topics came up. So We'll, we'll see how we do with time, um, and I will uh, try and check the chat at some point as well, uh, so we can get some of those questions uh, from the audience answered. Um, so first topic uh, being ideas of um, transparency or opaqueness um, that uh, kind of keep cropping up in each of your works. Um, I really love uh, Loved learning that in early Italian painting, um, often colors weren't uh, mixed on a palette and then applied to a surface. Uh, with egg tempera, you often say if someone wanted um, to paint green, they would uh, mix some yellow, put it on the surface, and then mix some blue and paint that over the top of the yellow um, in order to create these uh, kind of optical mixing situations. Um, and so if either, you know, any of you wanted to speak to the way you're using kind of transparency uh, or opaqueness uh, in your work, that would be cool. I can start, um, you know, just get the ball rolling here. But um, I guess I would say when I when I first started um, my undergraduate and especially coming um, at uh, painting from a printmaking kind of perspective, I had a lot of hard edged flat color relationships kind of butting up against each other. And that's where kind of the punch was happening. And through sort of opening up my work and my process while I've been in graduate school, I've really embraced transparency and which is inherently a part of printmaking as well. Um, but there is a lot more surprise or like unknown that happens when you work with transparent colors and allow things to show through. Um, so that's been a really exciting part of kind of switching that gear um, personally. In my work, I kind of play with the sort of suggested transparency through like a kind of flat, like color math kind of thing, like, to make something look like there's something behind it. Um, it would take like the gradual mixing of the foreground color and the background color, something like that. And I don't know why I do that other than that it's like a fun game and it's like, it's exciting for that trick to kind of snap into place where there's 
it's like none of none of those experiments are really here as explicitly but i've had somewhere just like play with panels and it's sort of a way to like learn about color relationships um but yeah and then that like that purple one of mine i think about transparency a lot and like the transparency of a repeating um yeah like a transparency of a repeating system that sort of indicates that it's going behind um a field of color or something like that and i think about like background universal background radiation and like sound and other invisible forces that can kind of be evoked through sort of like um transparency and i guess it doesn't have to be like a strictly mixed transparency either it could be any kind but yeah that's what i think about cool. um alex i wonder if i could throw the next topic to you um i realized that uh hopefully everyone can see uh the panelists on the right hand side of their screen um and brianna and alex you have uh, your work behind you and it's you know taking up the whole the whole background space and you know it's been tough with uh galleries being closed because our experience of art has been you know often kept to the size of a screen and i think especially with all these works it's it's so important to get in front of them and be kind of taken up in this world of color that is across our periphery and so um i'd love i'd love if you wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the importance of scale in your work i mean i know you talked about robert swain and um, being his studio assistant and creating those grids that are you know you can be in each color but then you can step back and uh be in this kind of systematic process as well um so how do you think about scale in your I think similarly that in this work from a distance, you kind of have the whole map, but as you get closer, especially from a point like this, which is 70 by 80, you start to sort of find all the little places where you can kind of hang out, where you can like sit, where you can kind of move through. And that can also, this work, speaking of transparency, it's all so layered. There are um, so many small color relationships that are, that you don't read from a photograph or from a, a you know, or the screen or from too many, too far away. So uh, scale is always, I think, um, something to strive for in terms of wanting immersion into like a particular kind of world, which um, color to me can so much create these kind of strange extraterrestrial spaces um, like nothing else can. So yeah, uh, plus I'm at Yale, so I want to take advantage of this beautiful studio space as much as possible. Totally, totally. Right, we're, we're short on time, so I'm, I'm going to keep firing out these topics. Um, so next one, material exploration. I think you'll all be able to see that, you know, these artists um, have developed really innovative ways of uh, using their materials. And um, I'm sure there have been many uh, hours in the studio, um, exciting ones and frustrating ones. And uh, how is it in how important is it for each of you um, to be in the studio and be very experimental and kind of non-judgmental on the process and letting these kind of intimate relationships uh, with you and the material build up to really create works where uh, that we can see, you know, the, the colors really singing? Um, I guess I'd say for me, especially using a lot of like transparency and kind of having things unveil themselves, but also just as a greater, kind of uh, uh, importance during my time at grad school is like I've been as inventive as I can or like as egoless as I can in the creation in terms of not not putting a value judgment on the work and and really letting things start to happen um, and also making a lot of work that I, I don't show and that I think that's that was like a big part of a new part of being in grad school for me it was like I need to kind of be in a vacuum and make work that I'm going to paint over a lot. <laughs> um, so yeah, and I mean, I don't know, I, I kind of have a question for Brianna, which is about how you find the texture or the surface or like kind of the raised bits, which are definitely intentional and often emphasized change the color experience. Um, and I also wanted to just say that 
I think Alex was talking, talking to me about this the other day, but just in terms of scale, like window versus door and like painting as a portal. Um, and that's, that's that, but I'll, I'll, I'll pass that over to Brianna. Cool. I love that, um, window door, uh, and the, like just the relationship, the scale of the body in terms of like the scale of the painting. And I've been thinking about that a little bit more as we have more space. I'm like, oh, I can make a painting that you could like climb into and that changes things versus something that you had to stuff back into a suitcase or like not have in the kitchen anymore. Um, like uh, the texture, yeah, I think the texture of the paintings was kind of like in working in such a strict, like regimented way, it was just something to not care about. Like something about the um, system is super complicated. And so there's like a giving up um, in a way, like just something not to grapple with when you're grappling with um, something that's like fastidious. Um, but then also I think there's like a certain kind of um, like topographical like noise that starts to emerge like because they do kind of like the blobs kind of like ooze out randomly and um, so yeah I think it like introduces a, an amount of noise and like for this red painting back red and green painting striped painting back here I think that the texture causes it to like if you walk from one side to the other causes a kind of like um, a shift that's maybe like those like corrugated thingies that like those fancy bookmarks when you're a kid I don't know um, but yeah like something clumsy introduced into a space that otherwise is relatively strict I think that's how I think of the, the blobs if I can I think it's really nice also to have like something tactile to grab onto with your eye in this work too and your hands if you're if no one's watching <clears throat> just kidding <laughs> so I, I know you just uh, use the word noise to kind of talk about your paintings. Do any of you um, think about synesthesia, have that kind of experience with taste, with smell, um, with music, uh, with language? Um, do you have those kind of transmodal uh, perceptions in, in any way in, in your life? Um, yeah. I think a lot about it um, in my work in terms of like, uh, with like those first rainbow paintings, I feel like you can sense like a strum or a hum with them. But um, like, because of my like issues with hearing, I've been uh, trying to understand um, like in another uh, body of work, understand like what, how music behaves through like and smushing together like a chromatic scale and a musical scale and then translating like sheet music um, from that relationship. But it's not like from a pre-existing synesthetic condition, but sort of the desire to like learn a new language through that system of connections. Um, but yeah, and there have been a lot like the um, connection of the chromatic scale and the musical scale has been happening for a really long time like there are like hundreds of there are like plans for organs that that like disseminate light based on the color um that are like hundreds of years old the ideas for them and like uh music is also another way that people have tried to understand um the nature of color harmony and color relationships as well um so there are a lot of interesting things that come up not and that's not necessarily about like the the synesthetic condition in itself but about um a kind of like inherent relationship between um these two modes of sensing that have been going on for a long time thank you i like um, colors that i can taste <laughs> um like if a if i'm mixing a color like once it feels like juicy like there's a juiciness uh, scale that's all psychological and visual. And once it hits that juicy moment, it's ready. Uh, Especially when you're mixing a color and you're like, oh, I'd love to eat that. I know exactly. it's, it's like ripe, it's like a ripe <laughs> yeah, color. 
versus like a bruised color. I mean, both are seductive in the, in its own way. But I think there's like a lot of color seduction exists through synesthesia, through a sense connection that is really physical. And like, you know, going back to your previous question of, you know, experiencing painting through a digital platform because of, a, because of the conditions of COVID. Um, I think that, you know, there's a flat, there's an intense flattening that's happening. And that's part of the reason I wanted to bring up the texture just to, to you know, even mention tactility because the works have a, have a surface. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's just a really crazy time to experience painting through the screen. And color is totally changed by that, especially because screens are backed by light. And so color exists with a backlight, totally different than with a light on the on the surface. So And through a different system of like reproduction through the way that the that like there are certain colors that screens just don't do. Um, yeah. I mean, that leads me on to kind of wondering how um, color became an important uh, aspect in each of your practices. And I'm sure it's, you know, it's not just in art, you're, you know, you're walking around the world and experiencing and paying attention to color pretty, pretty intensely. So um, did your relationship with color um, evolve organically over time or was was there a moment where, uh, I don't know, maybe you saw an Alexander McQueen fashion show or you saw a huge mural or you, you know, went to a museum or a music festival or anything? Was, was there any moment that felt, wow, this is, this is a new experience, I need to put this into my work or did things kind of um, grow organically over time? That's, that's to anyone that wants to answer. Yeah. Just very quickly, I think um, going to punk shows, uh, when the lights would come on, purple and blue, it would just imbue everything with this atmosphere and this almost like, this, it made it something more than some of its parts. And I think that has always stuck with me and why I have this real um, sort of inclination towards deeper colors, because it draws you in and the way that you're drawn into this focus of a stage. Um, I, I can see there are lots of you out there and we, we haven't got a question yet. So um, one last try to, to, to get a question from the audience. That would be amazing. Um, no question is a silly question. Um, but uh, are, there, are, there any, um, are there any books on colors, um, essays, philosophers that you've read um, that have kind of, uh, introduced themselves and created um, kind of systems or rules or ideas that you think about in your practices? If anyone wants to take that, there's no need to take that. I think, uh, just some classics, so like Maurice Merleau-Ponty, you mentioned my soul. Uh, I who wrote a really good book called um, What Color is Sacred? I think um, Color in the Expanded Field is a, is a contemporary book on color theory that's worth looking into. Um, but honestly, going back to like uh, Husserl, I think, all the way back to just the basics of phenomenology, but I'm mm -hmm. like new books. Awesome. Thank you, Eric. Um, we have a question from David. Mitch, could you talk generally about color with riso printing and maybe the similarities and differences with painting? Thank you, David. Sorry, I got booted out of the of the Zoom, but I just oh called. oh, it's cool, it's cool. Um, did, did you can you yeah, see the question? Absolutely. Um, um, well, I was going to say before I, I uh, hopped out was that Leslie Dugood of Do Good Press. Um, has written a lot about color and they are a printmaker from a printmaking perspective. Um, but I will follow that up in talking about risograph in that it's a very set. So like when you think about color space, which is like the conditions in which the selected colors that you're using in a palette can create, um, riso has a very specific riso color space because there are only 
you know, 10 drums of ink, each of which are specific colors and have, you know, specific outcomes that can be achieved. But what I think is really exciting about Rezo is that you can really get into the full depth of what just two colors can do just by using tonal value as the main shifting guide. And another um, person who does that really well is Clay Hickson, who, who creates the smudge, which is an all risograph uh, printed newspaper. But each one is designed using a different duo tone printing process through risograph. And you can really have like a, you know, 20, 30 color um, publication just by using two colors and adjusting tonal values and different overlays. So I think that's something like, I think risograph and printing through risograph can really be a learning experience that will then inform the painting um, because it's al also kind of a research experience of how, how colors can interact. Thank you. Um, we have a question from Grace Lindsay. I hope you're okay with us taking this. Um, so from Grace, I am an artist who uses color too. Green is my color in the same way that Mitch was talking about pink as an important color to them in their work. But I do love all colors. Are there any colors that carry continued significance to each of you? I have the same thing with green too. <laughs> I think I also really have a thing for like plain primary green. Um, and I don't really know exactly what it is, except that like, I don't know. There's a certain kind of like family story behind like my birth that has to do with the dream of green. Um, and then it's like plantiness and lifiness and all this stuff that uh, goes against all this like cold, dark, dark wintry gray that we've been seeing. But, but yeah, like that like vibrant primary green is just like a very powerful thing to me. I'm not, I get, I'm not sure if I have another specific color that's as heightenedly important as pink, but I will say that I like to ask myself what my favorite color is daily and it's all, and that is a nice way to like think about more colors in general. Um, What's your favorite color today? Um, lilac, which is like kind of a purpley pink, but it, it leans into the purpley spectrum. I kind of call that color perk because it's right between purple and pink and, and it really can like stoke a, uh, a hearty argument about whether it's purple or pink. Um, but yeah, a little pinker than this lavender, just like a hair. <laughs> um, Ed, I know you used a yellow a lot when you were a student and I was a student at the same time. Why, why yellow? I mean, I, I, I still ask myself, Question. Um, and I, the, there are kind of potential childhood references. Um, I mean, I'm very influenced by the environments that, that, that I'm surrounded by. So um, I grew up in the countryside in England and we were uh, surrounded by fields of canola. So there was that really, really intense yellow um, all over the fields. And I, I wonder if that hadn't had an influence um, on my decision to use yellow. Um, but I think really uh, I was just creating a finite set of rules. Uh, so ways I could use the paint and the type of pigment I was using. Um, because especially when you're dealing with uh, a topic like color, it's, it's so vast and there are so many possibilities that uh, it's kind of hard to know where to start sometimes. And so, um, by putting these these finite restrictions um, on a topic, it actually kind of opens up um, di different possible paths to follow. Um, so yeah, I think yellow was you know it, it could have been any other color, probably not green, but um, but yeah, it, it didn't have a kind of specific uh, symbology or anything. Um, I realize we are. We're a little bit over, so I just want to say a huge thank you um, to our three artists. And if each of you would like to um, plug your Instagram pages, your websites, 
uh, any exhibitions that you're in so people can uh, hopefully safely go out there into the world and, and see your work and ex experience it, um, not on the screen. So Alex, do you, do you want to start? Because you're at the, on the top of the video. Yeah, my Instagram is instagram.com slash alexanderpuzz. Uh, you can also check out my website, alexanderpuzz.com. Uh, also, uh, keep an eye out. I have some stuff coming up in the fall. We we'll, uh, haven't announced it yet, but uh, keep, keep watching. And uh, you'll see some stuff soon. Uh, my Instagram is at Brianna Bass and my website is Brianna K Bass, but my website is also on my Instagram usually. So you can just do it that way and I keep it all pretty updated. So that's the best way to keep track of me and my movements. Um, and I have a show this summer coming up at Channel to Channel Gallery in Nashville, Tennessee. So I expect to see you all in Tennessee in June. Um, my Instagram is Mitch Miller Print. Uh, my website, which is updated like once yearly, is MitchMiller.com. Um, and I have a current exhibition up in Soho in New York at Super Chief Gallery. Um, go check it out safely if you can. Um, but yeah, I also dropped that in the chat. So feel free to look there as well. And also a big thanks to, to Lindsay who, um, who has been sorting out all the technical side of things and helping this whole open studios uh, run really nice and smoothly. Thanks, awesome. thanks, thanks so much, Ed. Really appreciate you coming and moderating today. Oh, of course. Of course. Yeah, it's been you. a pleasure to, to listen to all of you. Cheers. So, yeah, thank you everyone for coming. Thank you for coming. Bye. Bye, -bye.